our guest. Father John Zeta is a graduate of Bishop McDevitt, class of 1969. He is the exorcist for the Diocese of Harrisburg. He was asked to assume this role by Bishop McFadden in 2011. So give a warm introduction, greeting to Father Zeta. As always, we begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Saint Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And I know it's going to be mostly questions that you have submitted, but I want to uh, we'll start off with one question that I always get asked all the time, and that is, why did you decide to become an exorcist? And the answer is very simple. The bishop said, I want you to be the exorcist, and that's how it happens. So it's not the priest who chooses the job, it's the bishop who chooses the priest. So in that, that as you said, it's been since 2011 that I have been the exorcist for the diocese. So I want to just kind of lay the groundwork, if you will, before we begin. And what I want to do is I want to read some scripture. First of all, you realize, of course, Ash Wednesday is coming up, and so we begin the celebration of Lent very soon. And so what you're going to hear in the beginning of Lent is a particular passage from scripture. I'm going to read the same story from both the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark, very, very brief. And it is, in fact, the temptations of Jesus. And I'm only going to focus on one of the three temptations. And it says, The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said to them, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. That was Matthew. Mark's gospel says this. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And said to him, to you I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it shall all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. If you, what's important in those passages is this. Not so much what Jesus says as much as what he doesn't say. You notice the devil says, all of this is mine, and I can give it to whomever I want. Jesus doesn't dispute with him. Jesus doesn't, you know, argue with him. He doesn't say, no, 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 that's not true. Because in fact, it is true. Because of the original sin, this entire world belongs to the devil. In any number of different places in scripture, Jesus calls Satan the prince of this world. And that's exactly what he is. He controls this world until the end of time. He sets up his own kingdom in this world. And this is where the coming of Christ into the world is to break the power of Satan and to establish the kingdom of God in its place. So in a certain sense, until the end of time, there is this constant battle between these two kingdoms. Here's a very, very important thing to remember. Every single child from the very first moment of their conception belongs to the devil. 
It's part of his world. It is baptism that removes that child, us, from Satan's dominion and makes us children of God. However, it is possible during the course of a lifetime that people can do different things, make different choices, and commit different sins and put themselves back into the kingdom of Satan. And that's what it's all about. People get in trouble. They can't figure out how to get out. So they call the church. Specifically, they call the exorcist. That gives you an idea of some of the stuff that's happening. We'll hopefully be able to expand on some of that, and we'll see what kind of questions that you guys have to ask. So, Thank you very much, Father. So I'm going to get right into the questions that were submitted by the students. So the first question is, you kind of began to cover it. What is an exorcist? What is an exorcist? The exorcist's job is to stand officially in the authority of the bishop and of the church to combat the forces of evil, head-to-head, one-on-one, the priest and the power of the kingdom of Satan. Thank you very much. And following up on that, what is a demon? What is a demon? A demon is a fallen angel. At the beginning of time, even before the creation of the world, God created these spiritual creatures that we call angels. And they were all given a test. And they had to answer yes or no. Basically, it came down to one simple thing, to submit to the will of God or to hold on to their own will. And there were many who said, "Uh uh-uh, I don't want to serve. I want what I want. I want what I want. And so they lost the beauty and the gifts that God had wanted to give them. And those are the demons. Trust me, the devil is real. And he hates us, every single one of you. And he wants you in his kingdom rather than in God's kingdom. So demons are all around us, just as angels are all around us. And demons, even though they fell from God's grace, have never lost their nature, their power as angels, spiritual creatures. They're all around us, and uh, we need to trust the good angels and beware of the demons, those who have turned their backs on God. Thank you. Could you talk about the different uh, forms of spiritual oppression, what it might take, and then briefly, like, what is possession? Okay. Well, we'll get to the possession in a moment. The first thing to realize is this. The first level of demonic attack against any one of us, every one of us, is temptation. We are all under temptation. We just I read that passage. Jesus himself was tempted by the devil in the desert, okay, after his baptism. And so we all suffer temptation. It's part of being who we are as human beings, part of our fallen nature as a result of the original sin. So temptation is the very first level on which we are going to be tempted into the kingdom of Satan. Um, I'll throw some little stories here and there of things that I've encountered just so that you can see this along the way. I had a call one day from a priest. He said, I have a young man in my parish who just called me and he's panicking. And he said, what happened was this guy had some friends and they said, there's this house that we know of that's supposed to be haunted. And we want to go over there and we want to play with a Ouija board. They want to see if anything happens. So the guy said, okay, I'll go, uh, provided that you get me drunk first. So they did, all right? I suspect he did more than just drink, but that's okay. So they went to this haunted house and they played with the Ouija board. And guess what? It worked. And the demon that was talking to them said, oh, you know, answered their questions, all that kind of stuff. And then the next thing you know, demon said, don't worry. Everything stays here, it's part of the house, nothing will go with you home. Well, demons are liars. So he goes home, and he's under attack physically. He's being attacked in his bed and being attacked in his room, and he doesn't know what to do. He's really scared, he calls his priest, he said, Father, what do I do? The priest calls me and says, what do I do? He said, this was an easy one, because this kid just was stupid. He did a stupid mistake. 
And he said, just tell him to go to confession and that'll take care of the problem. The single most powerful weapon that we have against the devil is the sacrament of penance. So if you haven't been there for a while, I strongly recommend get there. Because anything that you confess to the priest, you know, is that great secret, the seal of the confessional. The priest can't talk about anything that you tell him in confession. The demons can't know anything that you tell the priest in confession either. That's blocked from their awareness. So when you go to confession and go often, be full, honest, complete about what it is that you have to confess because the devil can never use it against you. So the first thing is temptation, all right? We're all under temptation. There's no way to avoid that. The second thing is, I guess you want to call it uh, oppression, where you know people do stupid things and then they literally open themselves up. And I guess we're going to get to portals in a couple of minutes with some of the questions. But I'll get to that, how we do that. But so people open themselves up, and the next thing you know, they're under a serious attack. And sometimes it actually happens physically. A person may wake up with scratches. They may make, I've had people with, you know, hand marks, burn marks that showed up on their bodies, all kinds of different things where the demons will literally attack them. That's demonic oppression. Or another case may be what we call demonic obsession where a person just gets all these thoughts in their mind and they're just driving them crazy. They can't help it. In fact, you know, one of the things that demons like to do is try to, com to tempt a person to commit suicide. They get so depressed, so discouraged that they just want to kill themselves, you know? And I've, unfortunately, I've lost one by that way. Um, a person did commit suicide because she just couldn't handle what was she was under anymore, the attack that she was under anymore. And so it, it's a really sad kind of thing because you see, you know, if you commit suicide, the devil wins. But the devil can't kill you. He's not permitted to do that, all right? So if you go to confession, you stay close to the church, stay close to the sacraments, that breaks some of that power that he has over us in terms of temptations and those kinds of things. I have another case I'll tell you about where, again, a young lady was possessed, I'll come to that in a moment, and she had had it, she couldn't handle it anymore, she was gonna commit suicide and she decided to go out and hang herself in the tree in the backyard. And as she was heading out the door, she saw a statue of St. Michael the Archangel on the table by the door. And something told her to pick it up and take it along with her, so she did. She went out, put the statue on the ground, put the noose around her neck, and all of a sudden her mother happened to be walking past, looked out the window, saw what was happening, screamed bloody murder as any mother would, and at just that moment, a police officer was coming by, heard the scream, came running in, and saved the girl's life. You see, St. Michael is fighting on our side. That's why I always start with a prayer to St. Michael. This is battle, this is a warfare, all right? So sometimes, as I said, we get overwhelmed by these thoughts. Sometimes, though, people go even further, and they do all kinds of really dumb things and they actually give themselves over to the power of Satan, all right? I have a case that I'm gonna to read to you a little bit when we get to that. But the demons can then actually literally take over a person's body and have them do things that they don't necessarily want to do. A demon can possess a person and then it becomes a very serious case, a very serious situation where you have to call in the priest in order to be able to uh, free the person from the power of Satan. Now, let me just, uh, you know, as a disclaimer here, uh, just let you know, I also have a PhD in psychology. And so somebody might say, well, it's mental illness. It's, you know, no, no. They go together. There's never one or the other. Sometimes demons will you know, mimic um, mental health issues as a way of throwing you off the track. Or sometimes, you know, it might be the other way around. A person may have genuine mental health issues, but the demons will exploit those and take advantage of those, right? So we have to investigate. We have to sort it out. We have to figure out which is which. We, both, we have to deal with both parts of it, though. It can't be just one or the other. It's never one or the other. It's always both. And so, you know, mental health and spiritual issues go together. They have to be worked out together. But a person can be possessed. And then we have to not only, again, the thing we talk about exorcism, that's what an exorcism is. It's driving the demon out. 
their control over a person's body, over a person's life. But the important thing to realize is the fact it's not a magic formula, it's not a magic ritual. I don't come in and wave a magic wand. That's what a lot of people want us to do. Come in, say the magic words, and get rid of the demon, and then they can go on and do the same old stuff that they always did. No, it doesn't work that way. Con uh, exorcism is a conversion process. A person has to change their way of life. Whatever it was that got them into trouble in the first place, they have to make some serious changes. And so that's part of what the process is about. Drive the demon out, then get them back on the right track. Thank you, Father. Uh few questions to build on that but first you mentioned the, the mental health issue so what does the process look like if someone comes to you uh, as far as figuring out whether it's mental health demonic both how's that work and that happens constantly um, I get calls and emails literally every day literally from all over the world and um, when I have a case close by thanks be to God I ask them the first thing we have to do is they have to get a mental health evaluation we have to sort out and see if there are some genuine mental health issues at work here, all right? Um, and a lot of times, too, for example, somebody will come to me and they'll have some issues, and I'll say, have you seen a therapist? Yes. Are, are you on the medication? Yes. The next question I always ask is this, does it help? If the person says no, it doesn't help, that tells me that maybe the problem is really spiritual at heart. But if they say, well, yes, it does help, and they say, okay, well, then maybe there's more of a mental health issue here that can be treated by medication or therapy. But they go together, right? And you have to treat both. But so we always begin by a mental health evaluation just to see what other issues might be at work uh, along with the spiritual issues. Thank you. I'm gonna move back to, you mentioned you had the case with the boy who was in a haunted house playing with a Ouija board. He was also a drunk, so those are things not to do. Could you mention some other specific things that might open you up to this kind of thing? The truth of the matter is, I'm, I'm sure, you're all modern 21st century students. You all have access to the internet. You all, all the stuff that's out there on the internet, right? Um, we had a case not too awful long ago of one of our parochial schools and one of the teachers caught a seventh grade student preparing to cast a spell right on their school grounds. And um, what they did was they confiscated the material. The, the student had spell books and all kinds of material for casting a spell. They were going to put a curse on one of their classmates. So they called me in and I had to do, well, to go through the protection of the school the protection of the student who was under a curse. But there can be all kinds of different things that we can get into, all right? The occult stuff, all right? Crystals, yoga, Reiki, so many of these other kinds of things that people think, oh, that's just every day. No, those are all tools that give the devil an, an opening, a doorway. Um, how many of you know what a speak box is? All right, some of you do, okay. Um, a speak box, with us, I'm glad not more of you do. A speak box is a situation where um, it's supposed to, it used to be you could buy them on Amazon.com. It was like a cell phone, and it was supposed to be uh, enabling you to speak to the dead, all right? So uh, I had a case of a woman, I've actually had three cases of these. I had a woman who had a younger brother uh, with serious mental and physical illness, um, she cared for him very lovingly. He died. She was distraught. Um, one of her friends said to her, well, you know, get, get a speak box and you can talk to him and see how he is, if he's okay. So she did. She got a speak box. Now you can just get an app on your phone. On your phone. But well, So she got this speak box and she was, this voice came to her and it was her brother's voice and she talked to him and he assured her that he was fine, he was doing well, and um, not to worry about him. And that was it, except for the fact that as I told her, this wasn't your brother. This was a demon who was pretending to be your brother because he got your trust, he got your confidence. Now she is literally under attack, under serious physical attack, it's constant temptations. It was a very, very difficult thing to be able to break that uh, from, you know, because again, it was her love for her brother what sent her into that in the first place. These are things that we call portals. 
we always look for these kinds of portals, these kinds of openings, things that people do that will open the doorway to that other world, all right, which is the world of the demonic. All right? So, you know, speak boxes are very, very dangerous. You have to be very careful about that kind of stuff. There's another situation, for example, <clears throat> and I just have to lay this out there, um, the, Mas the Masons, Masonic orders. You know, the Masonic orders are all demonic. We've had many, many cases of people who have been under serious um, attack, spiritual attack, because of the history of Masonic involvement in their families. And so those things have to be broken as well. There are curses that go along with those, and they have to be broken. Um, so there are portals. There are things that people will do, playing with Ouija boards, all kinds of stuff that, um, that people will do. Uh, as I said, crystals is one that a lot of kids get into, uh, tarot cards. Here, here's an interesting one, a case that I knew of, uh, a young girl. Her, her grandmother used to read tarot cards. And the young girl would just sit on her grandmother's lap, and that was it. The girl grew up, and now she's in college. And some of her college roommates decided they were going to play with these tarot cards, and they get out the little book, and they're going to read the tarot cards to see what the fortunes are and that sort of stuff. When the girl stood there, and she said, oh, I know what that is. She said, my grandmother used to do that all the time, and I can tell you exactly what that was. And she read the tarot cards, and boom, she was possessed, fully possessed. The demon came out, and the first things that he said to her, stupid witch, stupid witch, I had to wait in her for 20 years for her to make the first move. As soon as she stepped into the world of the occult, he possessed her. He was there the whole time. But she made the move, and he took advantage of it. So we have to be careful of all of those kinds of things, because they're real, and they do cause problems. So we call these portals. There are many, many different kinds of things out there today that open the door to the demonic. Thank you very much. So once you, if you're dealing with someone, once you move past the initial stage, mental health evaluation, what are some signs an exorcist looks for of demonic possession? The church actually lays down in the ritual for exorcism um, four specific signs that we could look for that might give us a clue, a hint, that the person may be possessed. So the first one is the ability to know or to speak languages that they've never studied or had any, any influence on, right? So the ability to know different languages. And I've had that sort of thing happen in a number of times. Um, a second one would be kind of what we would call um, unusual superhuman strength or physical abilities, right? Let me come back to that one in a, in a second. Another one would be um, occult knowledge, what we would call the ability to know things that they normally should not have any ability to know. And then the fourth one is an aversion to sacred objects. So let me tie two of those together. I had a case one time of a woman, we were interviewing her to determine if she was possessed or not. And we were in a church. The only time that she could come into church was when I told her, I will see you in church. So she's in church. I'm in the pew. She's in the pew behind me. Two of my team members, and I always have a team with me, two women were behind her. There were actually a medical doctor and a nurse who were actually these two women. The doctor had a, a bag, a woman's bag, not a purse, but just a bag, in which she had a first-class relic. Now, if you know what a relic is, of course, it's, it's the part of a saint's body or something that had belonged to a saint. She had this in this bag, and during my conversation with this person, the woman behind her just kind of leaned forward with this bag and placed it against the back of the pew that the woman was sitting in. And all of a sudden, the woman screamed, jumped up in the air, flew into the aisle. What was that? What did you do? What did you hit me with? She had no idea that there was anything there. She didn't know what had happened, but she felt and reacted to the presence of that saint's relic in that bag that had been put against the back of her pew. That's the ability to know things. That's the ability to, um, of aversion to a sacred object that she didn't even know was there. I've had many of those kinds of cases. The one particular case was a rather interesting one. Um, again, that same young lady who um, attempted suicide, she, when she had been as possessed, we freed her, 
but she didn't change the way she lived, and she went back to the same old stuff, and we had, she became repossessed. It was much worse the second time. And so in this case, she starts manifesting, and she would go into these seizures. And so one day, her mother rushed her to the emergency room, and she called me, and she said, so-and-so is in the emergency room, and they said, first of all, now we're talking about a petite Hispanic girl, about 18 years old, right? It took four big police officers just to hold her down. Second, they told me that they gave her tranquilizers that should have taken down an elephant and had no effect on her. She's in the emergency room. The doctors go out of the room to kind of you know, consult to see what to do next. And they came back in the room, and I'm not making this up, they found her literally climbing up the wall. Pretty good sign that she's possessed. Right? These things do happen, they are real. And they happen right here in our diocese. Right here in our diocese. It's not just you know, something you see in Hollywood. It actually does happen. Right? So um, those are the things that we look for. Right? The superhuman abilities, knowledge of the occult, knowledge of things that you should not have uh, uh, knowledge of, uh, aversion to the sacred, the ability to know other languages. Um, those are the things that we kind of look for. Now, they're not always all present. There can be other things that happen. For example, I had a man who came to see me, and uh, we were testing to see if he was possessed. And I said, okay, we're going to recite the Athanasian Creed. I know that none of you know what that is. But it's just a, a creed, a very long uh, creed that was done by St. Athanasius many, many centuries ago. So we're going through, you know, and it says, you know, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but there's only one God, and it goes on and on and on. But any time that I said anything about the Son of God becoming man, he manifested. He was screaming, he was rolling on the ground, he was doing all kinds of work, because that's one of the things that demons hate more than anything else, the fact that the Word became flesh, that God became man and dwelt among us, right? And so that was a good indication of the fact that this guy was probably possessed, even though he didn't manifest any of those other kinds of things that I was talking about. Thank you very much. So you, you kind of touched on this. You mentioned with that woman how she had been delivered and then repossessed because she did not depart from her the, right. what had happened to her before. So how common is that for someone who is delivered to return to it and become repossessed? Um, you know... <laughs> What happens, in, in, and thanks be to God, in that particular case, I can tell you that eventually, after much work and much effort, um, she has turned her life around. Things are, things are really good, and we're really happy about that. Um, if any of you actually listen to any of this kind of stuff on the internet, um, there's a, a, a blog that's called uh, The Exorcist Files, right? Uh, and that's done by uh, Father Carlos Martins, and he has a series of cases, and actually, um, this particular case we're talking about, I did. They asked me to present a case which is on that blog, um, and they do a kind of reenactment of the case, all right? And uh, so if you go online and look for that, Father Carlos Martin's Exorcist Files, um, and you'll find uh, a case that I did in this particular case. Um, what happens generally is this. Um, first of all, that's the only one that I've had where the person was possessed, freed, and then became repossessed. Thank God it's the only one, all right? But what actually ends up happening a lot of time is that you start working with somebody and they don't want to make the changes that you ask them to. They don't want to do what they need to do in order to be freed. And so the, the process is never completed and then we lose them. And there's not much I can do about that. You know, if they're not going to help, if they're not going to work with me, then I, I can't force them. Yeah, well, building upon that, so how common is that? Do you just tell the person I can't, I can't do anything for you because you're not working with and, me. And it does happen. You know, I, I, I'll say to somebody, you know, actually, I have one right now um, who has been after me constantly, constantly, constantly. And um, I guess I can say this because you, you don't know. He's actually a graduate of this school. <laughs> um, and um, I'm pretty sure that he has, uh, he's paranoid schizophrenic. Um, and I constantly have been saying, you've got to get a mental health evaluation. You have to get to a psychiatrist. And he does not want to do it. 
he doesn't want to follow through. He doesn't do what we're asking him to do, okay? And so it's very, very difficult. If they're not going to do uh, what we ask them to, um, then there's nothing I can do. I'm, I'm, I'm up against the wall. Uh, they have to be willing to cooperate and to do what's expected of them if we're going to be able to free them. All right? But we always start with the mental health issue, although in this particular case, I'm pretty sure it's primarily a mental health issue um, which demons are taking advantage of. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question has to do with the, uh, the right of exorcism and how this works. So, first of all, we read in the gospel where you, you have the man that was possessed with, they, divided, they identified themselves as legion, many. So, how, how common is it for there to be multiple spirits, and do you have to individually exorcise them by name? How's that work? Actually, um, that's the most common thing, is that there are multiple spirits. It's very rare to have one where there's only one, all right? Because what happens is, if you want to call them these higher level demons that are up in the hierarchy, you know, just like they talk about, you know, there were nine choirs of angels from the highest to the lowest, the same thing that those, those demons have that same hierarchy, all right? So these higher level demons, they will push the lower level demons forward because when you do an exorcism, they actually get punished, they, get, they suffer, all right? They hurt, all right, through the body of the person who's possessed. Um, and so they'll push the, the lower ones out first so that they take all the punishment, right? So uh, it's, it's very rare. Even that first case that I talked about, the first time that we um, dealt with her, she had three, three demons. There are certain things that you can ask, uh, um, certain questions that you are allowed to ask the demons during the rite of exorcism, right? One of them would be, how many of you are there? A second question is, what gives you the right to be here? See, again, going back to what I said at the very beginning, demons, you know, they're legalists. They only offer, they only uh, work according to the law, that what's laid down for them, right? They can't violate the law. They can only do what God allows them to do. So if we give them the opening, they take it. They have a right to it, all right? Um, and one of the problems we run into, unfortunately, is that so many calls that we're getting today are coming from people who are not Catholic, and when you start to talk to them, they're not even baptized. And then I have a real problem. What can I do? Or if I have a Catholic, but who hasn't been practicing their faith for a long time, you know, well, the first thing I say is get to confession, get back into the graces of the church. You know, these things are very, very important. So there, again, we can ask them, you know, what gave you the right to be here? Uh, how many of them are there? And also, we can ask them their name, all right? Because sometimes when the demon tells me their name, it gives me a clue as to what it was that gave them the right to be there in the first place, all right? And that's the key. Um, because they could have gotten into all kinds of different things, and the demon that's possessing them might be the demon of impurity, or it might be the demon of anger, or it might be the demon of hatred. There could be many different kinds of things. Again, I'll give you a simple example. I had a case um, of a lady, not Catholic, who was experiencing all kinds of phenomena in her home. You know, the, the, the typical things, you know, doors opening and closing and lights going on and off and all kinds of noises and so forth. Not Catholic, she calls her minister. The minister comes to the house, does prayers, and nothing works. So then um, the minister says to the woman, well, call the Catholics, they deal with that stuff. So they called the local Catholic priest, and he went to the house, and he did all the prayers, and nothing worked. So then he said, well, call the exorcist. So they called me. So I went to the house. Three times, actually, did all of the prayers, and nothing worked. And I'm saying, something's not right here. So finally, I said to this woman, I want to see you at the Catholic Church. I want to see you in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament, even though she wasn't Catholic. So we were at the church. And I was praying over her, and then it came to me, something came to me, and I said to her, is there anything that you're holding on to? Anything that you just won't let go of? Then she said to me, well, um, yeah, she said, um, when I was young, she said I was, oh, I was abused, not sexually, but emotionally, psychologically, physically. And she said she was just so angry at those people who abused her. And I said to her, did you ever forgive them? Well, how can I forgive them for what they did to me? What are you talking about? I said, well, you've got to let it go. Well, she said, I just don't think about it. And I said, yes, you do. You're holding on to this, 
And this is what's giving the demons the ability to attack you. Your anger and your unwillingness to forgive. That's what you're holding on to. And until you forgive them for what they did to you, you will still be under attack. So finally, not too long after that, I got a call from the Catholic priest who said to me, oh, Mrs. So-and-so called me, called me, wanted to let me know that she took your word and everything is cleared up, everything has stopped, and she's just so very, very happy. See, sometimes we can give the demons an opening just by those kinds of things. The anger we hold on to or the sins that we commit or the, whatever it is that we won't let go of, give the demons the ability to work on us and to manipulate us. Thank you. Maybe you could, this is one of the questions that were asked, uh, maybe you could try to put a percentage on it. How, how many non-Catholic cases do you have? How many non-Catholics visit you? I, I get a lot of them, unfortunately. Let me... Um, Never go anywhere without my iPad. So, let's see here. Yesterday, I got two emails from two different priests. And uh, I'm going to read you just one of them. I received an email from a non Catholic who lives in who said that her daughter lived with her boyfriend who was involved in Satan worship. They are no longer together. She has a female friend who puts spells on people. A year ago, the mother and daughter took down upside down crosses in the daughter's home, as well as Baphomet statues. You probably know who Baphomet is. That's that demon that they show with the little children and the Satan worshipers are all after him. Also in December 2022, while the mother and daughter were taking down the upside down crosses in the daughter's home, the daughter disappeared and reappeared, foaming at the mouth. The mother touched a cross to the daughter and the daughter replied, don't have it touch my body, it burns. The mother says that the daughter experiences chest pain and she has thoughts about wanting to die all the time. She also seems to be in darkness with no escape. The daughter was reaching out to her mom for help and so she was calling Catholic churches for help. That's a case I got yesterday. Right, so it shows you some of the elements involved in it, but they're not Catholics. Right? So, it's, it's difficult in a sense because they don't have the sacraments, they don't have the blessed sacrament, they don't have the sacrament of penance, they have all of these issues, but they don't have the remedies, they don't have the tools, they don't have the, the weapons to fight back. So it's much, much more difficult to deal with in that particular case. So what I'm going to have to do is first of all find out, do they go to church at all? Do they have a church that they belong to? Have they even been baptized? All right, that's another really important issue here. Um, and so some of the things that we have to look at, if they really want to be free, we have rituals and prayers uh, of deliverance that we can use to help them. But the person has to want to be free. I have a case of a woman who is possessed. And we've done the exorcism ritual on her many times. Uh, and we, we really wonder, does she really want to be free? Because we can't seem to kind of drive it out once and for all. So it, it, it's an issue that is challenging. Yeah, thank you, Father. Uh, what, about, uh, what about somebody, is this possible, you can go into this, who, could somebody be attacked or possessed through no fault of their own? Yes, okay. Can somebody be possessed by no fault of their own? Again, that same young lady that I was talking about, uh, the very first case that I had, when we did the, it was an interesting case, but anyway, when we began the ritual for exorcism, we asked how many demons there were, and they were said, said three. And we said, um, what gave you the legal right to be here? And the answer the demons gave was this. Her father 
gave her to us at her birth. Turns out, Hispanic family, the mother was Puerto Rican, the father was Cuban. The father was a practitioner of Santeria. How many of you know what Santeria is? I'm sure the Hispanic would know what that is, yes, and it's very dangerous. So this father practiced Santeria. They have these statues of different saints that they pray to, but they're actually demons. And this particular case, the father did not want this child. He disowned her at her birth. Her mother told me that she literally had to take a taxi home from the hospital the day the baby was born. The father had authority, because he's his, her father, and he gave her to the demons on the day of her birth. So it was very easy to free her that first time because it wasn't her fault, all right? We freed her after one session and it was, it was great, but that's where she didn't change her life and she became possessed the second time, but it was very, very difficult the second time because this time it was her fault. It was not her father's fault. And it is possible that somebody could be cursed. Um, the curses are real. Just like that little young man that I was talking about at the, at the parochial school, uh, curses are real and they do have effects. You know, the word is a very powerful thing. Curses and blessings, right? So yes, a person can be possessed through no fault of their own. But then we have to find out what's going on and how to break that. But there are special uh, prayers um, and deliverances uh, to be able to break curses. Good, I'm gonna change pace a little bit here. So <clears throat> there are a lot of different ones, but how accurate are the movies about exorcist or exorcism? Okay, um, I'll say two things. First of all, um, I'll, I'll only refer to two movies. If you have other ones you wanna ask me about, okay. Um, the first one is an old movie, The Exorcist, the original movie, The Exorcist, all right? Um, I can tell you this much. Father Gabriel Amorath, who was the uh, exorcist for the Diocese of Rome for many years, now deceased, um, he was actually approached by the people who made the movie and asked, um, I think it was William Friedkin, he was asked, what did he think of that particular movie, all right? And his response was, he thought that some of the special effects were really over the top, but other than that, he thought the movie was pretty accurate, all right? Yeah, I haven't seen anybody's head spin around like they did in the movie, but I've seen a lot of other things, you know, people levitating and doing all kinds of stuff. But anyway, um, so those things are real. Uh, so he, he really liked the movie. The other movie that I will refer to is um, the movie Nefarious. How many of you have seen Nefarious? Okay, I say, suggest strongly, every teacher in this school must see that movie. Nefarious. Theologically, it is 150% accurate. If you want to know the devil's wiles and the devil's tricks, see that movie. It is excellent. I've seen it three times, and every time I watch it, I see something more in it that I didn't catch the first time. But very seriously, um, so I'm not always suggesting the students see it, but if you want to see it, yeah, it was available. Uh, it was in the theaters for quite some time, and uh, you can get it available on streaming and all that sort of stuff. Now, nefarious, excellent movie, 100% uh, accurate theologically. So seriously, teachers, please, please watch it. Good, so you get nefarious, five out of five. Sorry? Five out of five for nefarious. Very good. Yeah, yeah. five of five, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, couple, I'm gonna, we're gonna wrap up, so some really good ones here. Not much time already, huh? <laughs> um, well, you can okay. Want, I don't know. Uh, how can a person, two-fold question here, what's some of the things we can do to just basically protect ourselves? How important is it to have your house blessed? Okay, very, very good questions. Uh, again, as I said earlier, one of the strongest weapons that we have against the devil is the sacrament of penance, all right? go to confession on a regular basis. Now, you know, if you haven't committed any serious sins, once a month is okay, all right? If you commit a serious sin, get to confession immediately, all right? Because if you're in a state of serious sin, the devil has a hold on you, and, and he can do whatever he wants. He can manipulate you. And today, things are so totally out of control. I was just in Wichita, Kansas at the National Conference, 
last um, October, I was in Rome for the International Conference of Exorcists, and I can tell you, worldwide, things are out of control. And it is really bad. It's almost like, you know, literally, all hell has broken loose on earth, right? So number one, get to confession on a regular basis. Number two, yes, you should, I'm, being, I'm out constantly blessing homes right now, especially with the epiphany season. Um, your home should be blessed at least once a year. And these cardboard things that they have in your churches to put over the doors, those are not blessings. That's not a blessing, you know. Bug your priest to come to your house to bless it for you, all right? That's really, really important. The rosary, please carry your rosary in your pocket it's not that bad, but even more, say it <laughs> from time to time. The brown scapular, wear a brown scapular. And the other thing is the St. Benedict medal, all right? The medal of St. Benedict, very, very powerful uh, weapon against the devil. Make sure that you get it, and the priest, actually, that's the only medal that actually requires an exorcism and a blessing, and any priest can do it. It doesn't have to be me. Any priest can do it. Um, make sure you get one of those, wear it, or put it in your pocket, have it with you all the time. Very, very important, um, those kinds of things. Use holy water. For example, especially if you find you have trouble sleeping at night or you have some bad dreams, get holy water and bless your room, your bed, before you go to bed at night. Just sprinkle a little bit of water in your bed or in your, on your room. Um, you know, I had one case, and again, this is important, too, again, for some of the teachers to realize this, you know. The modern form of blessing, you, you just bless the water and that's it. But that's not the traditional form of blessing of holy water. Um, and I can tell you that all of the chancery people use the traditional form of holy water blessing. First, there's involved an exorcism of salt and then the blessing of the salt. Why do we exercise salt? Because salt is part of this world, okay? And so it's part of the kingdom of Satan. We have to remove it from Satan's grasp. Then we bless it. Exercise water. I won't go into that today. There's another whole lecture I could give just on that. And then you bless the water. And then there is a prayer blessing as you mingle the salt into the water. All right? And then there's a final prayer for the whole thing. Now, why that's important, I'll share an interesting example. I had a lady one time, I was interviewing her, and at the end I was sprinkling her with the holy water, and she jumped. She said, what was that? What did you do? I said, what do you mean? She said, I've been blessed with holy water lots of times, but whatever you had stung, I, I could really feel it. It was because it was the first time she had ever been blessed with water, holy water that had the salt in it, all right? And so why is that salt important? Because even when the water evaporates, the salt remains and the blessing is continued, all right? So those the protection things. So those are the things, use the sacramentals but the church gives us, the rosary, the scapula, the St. Benedict medal, all of those kinds of things, the holy water. Take advantage of those and use them. But again, the single most important and powerful weapon we have against the devil is the sacrament of penance. You get there regularly. But also, please, get the Mass and Holy Communion every Sunday. Hmm? Please. Thank you, Father. You mentioned, you used the phrase, all hell is broken loose. So if you could maybe, I don't know, you put a number on this, but how busy are you? So how many exorcisms or cases do you have a month or year how busy are you lately how busy am i well i you know i can just tell you about some of the my brother exorcists from all over the country and even from all over the world um things are very very bad and unfortunately even in the church today uh, there are too many priests and bishops who just don't buy into it they just think it's all mental health stuff and so there are many many things that individual parish priests can do now i'm going to step back one second the Diocese of Harrisburg is really, really solid, all right, as far as this kinds of thing is concerned. I, I get the calls and the emails constantly from our priests. They're really on target. They're really on board. And so we're really fortunate here in the diocese. It's not the case elsewhere. I get phone calls and emails, Indonesia, London, Dublin, from all over the world, literally, about people who have gone to their local parishes for help and been turned away. They're not getting the help that they need, and people are under attack. Um, and I can tell you, our, our guys are just, just really worn out. Um, there is um, uh, Monsignor Stephen Rossetti, who's from the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C. 
Uh, he has a thing online where people can actually go for deliverance ministries uh, on a monthly, he has a monthly uh, session online. I think he had over 10,000 people sign up at the last session, all right? Um, so I know Monsignor Rossetti. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really, really, really busy. And we're seeing more and more really out of control cases, things that are off the wall, something like what I was reading to you there a moment ago. So, yeah, things are, things are really bad. Yeah. Thank you. So, question is, here's a question. How do you personally prepare or keep yourself from becoming overworked, overtired, discouraged, things like that? <laughs> Good question. Um, the first thing is this. Um, I cannot do what I do without my own prayer life, right? To be able to get up, to have my morning time in prayer before the Blessed Sacrament. When I'm leaving here, heading back up, I have holy hour um, for the, the area at five o'clock. Um, so prayer is the absolute essential. The second thing is there, I have a team, all right, of professional people, doctors, lawyers, nurses. Um, I have a couple of guys I call my muscle men. They're there to hold people down when they start to attack me, which has happened a number of times. Um, so um, that, that's important, but then it's, it's also very, very important to be able to filter some of these things out. You can't always do what, you know, I, for example, this morning I had a phone call from um, a lady in um, Decatur, Georgia, and I'm trying to reach the exorcist in the Archdiocese of Atlanta uh, to be able to uh, refer her to him. Also had a call from Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, the same thing. Um, the people in Dublin and in London, I was in touch with a priest who knows those areas and who's going to be able to, you know, refer them. So that's what I try to do more than anything else is to be able to, you know, I can't be the exorcist for the country and for the world. Um, I can only do what I can do here, and that's what I try to focus on. Thank you. The question we're talking about uh, fallen angels or demons, have you ever had any experiences with angels, like good angels, or their intercession, anything like that? Oh, yeah, that happens all the time. You know, it, and, and I've, I've been attacked, you know, I'll, I'll give you the bad, bad side and the good side, but um, two winters ago, um, I had a situation where uh, we have um, a chapel, it's the Mission Church at, in Jonestown, Our Lady of Fatima, which the bishop has given me as our um, base of operation, so to speak, and um, there was a, we were scheduled an exorcism and the priest was bringing the person from, from another place and I was on my way there and um, the priest calls me and he says to me, Father, he, he says he doesn't want to go, he's too tired, he doesn't want to come. I said, no, that's the devil talking, he doesn't want him to come through with it, make him come. So he hangs up, I'm driving along, the next thing you know, phone rings again, he insists he's not going to come, he just does not want to do it. I said, well, I can't, we can't force him to come. So I said, okay. So I went, I went to make a U-turn to come back to my home. And just as I started, this snowstorm came up. Snow, sleet, just blowing all over the place. I couldn't turn. My car drifted and went down into a ditch. And I was fine, right? Called 911, the police came. I'm sitting in the police car while we're waiting for the uh, tow truck to come. I had $5,000 damage to my car, by the way. I'm sitting in the police car, and the police officer says to me, gee, I don't know where that storm came from. They weren't calling for any snow. There wasn't supposed to be anything like that. And just like that, it cleared up. All right? That was definitely a demonic attack. A demon was after me because of that. Okay? And here's one other case. So I was um, called from another diocese. They did not have an exorcist at that time. So I was, there was, again, a man who was in the Masons who wanted to get out of the Masons, which he did, but he's now under attack. And so they called me. I went to this diocese, and we were doing the prayers of renunciation that you have to go through to break the curses. After we were finished, the priest at this parish said to me, um, I'd like you to come back here. And he showed me this room. And he said, um, this room used to be a confessional. And he said, now it's just storage because a former pastor here um, was, when they issued the report of the child abuse, he was one of the worst offenders on that report. And this is where it happened, here in this confessional. He said, will you do an exorcism of this place? Which I did. Now again, this is another diocese. This is not here in our diocese. So I did, and I came home, and now I could feel I was under attack 
for what had happened, what I had done. So I called a friend of mine, another priest, exorcist, and I said, I'm under attack, I, I need some help. So he said, okay, I went to his church, we're standing before the altar, and he's praying some prayers of protection and deliverance for me. And all of a sudden, his church bell starts ringing. And we just kept on going, and then it started ringing a second time. And then I finally finished, and he said, I don't understand it. He said, you know, my church bells are on automatic timers, and they shouldn't have been going off at those times. I don't know why they were ringing. Well, it turns out that every time in the prayer he mentioned uh, the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, that's when the church bells rang. And I smiled and I said to him, Monsignor, you didn't know because you weren't there that the church I was in yesterday was the church of Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception. So that showed me that Our Lady was there protecting me even though the demon was trying to get at me. So, you know, I mean, those are... That's, there's lots of little things like that, but I, you know, those are just two powerful ones I thought I would share with you. Thank you very much. So I think we have time. One more question. One more question. Then, then I'll give you a blessing. And okay. then if you want to say anything, and then give us your blessing, sure. please, at the end. So last question I'm going to end with. What would you say to someone who's skeptical of all this? Open your eyes. Smell the coffee. Look around you. If you don't know what evil is, you don't live in the real world. Just look around you. It's all over the place. That's bad. So if they're skeptical, I feel sorry for them. Okay? All right? Thank you, Father. Would you give us your blessing, please? Absolutely. Amen. Just to tell you why I do it in Latin, you know, People don't realize, but there are three sacred languages, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Why are they important? Because those were the three languages that the name Jesus of Nazareth was printed on the cross on the crucifixion, right? So those are sacred languages, and the demons hate them. So when we use Latin, they hate it. So don't be afraid of Latin. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you very much.